death of uh, the father and duo son, uh, Mr. Jairaj and Benix in Tamil Nadu, created a nationwide outrage on the issue of custodial death. Thanks to Live Law for bringing this very eminent set of panelists together. We have today with us uh, Justice Deepa Gupta, who is a former judge of the Supreme Court. We have with us uh, Dr. Ashwini Kumar, who is a senior advocate in the Supreme Court and is also a former law minister. And we have with us Ms. Sunetra Chaudhary, who is a national editor of political affairs with Hindustan Times and is also an author of three books, most recent one being Black Warrant. A very warm welcome to all of you for today's session. Just to set the context for today's debate, you know, the George Floyd debate in the United States of America led the US Congress to recently pass a police reform bill, which has led to a series of questions in India about the status and the legal issues surrounding the anti-torture law. Now, just to give a quick glimpse at statistics, according to National Crime Records Bureau, from 2006 to 2016, there were about 1,022 reported deaths in police custody. Surprisingly, only 5% policemen were convicted. But in 2019 alone, as per a report published by the Hindu, there were about 1,730 deaths in custody, which comes roughly to about five deaths per day. Just to clarify, these are reported figures and of those which actually led to a death. So unreported custodial uh, torture cases, there is no way for India to have a document or a database of them yet. And as per another uh, interesting figure, about 74.4% deaths in police custody are attributed to either torture or foul play. Now we are during COVID-19 and all of us have been very, very appreciative of the Indian police as they have been our frontline COVID-19 warriors. So it wouldn't be fair to uh, you know, paint the entire police force with one single brush, but the issue of the breach of police power, specifically custodial torture is definitely an important concern. In India, we do have legally speaking, the Indian Police Act uh, 1861, but it's been a very long time since it has been amended. We do have specific provisions in the Criminal Procedure Code, for example, Section 132 and Section 197, which require that before prosecuting any public official, it's important to receive a prior sanction of the state. Now that makes it difficult to proceed against senior police officers when questions of custodial torture come up. Now, India, uh, just so that everybody knows, is a signatory to the Torture Convention, which was adopted by the General Assembly in 1984. But for India to ratify it, we need to pass a domestic law. We have with us Mr. Ashwini Kumar. Sir, you have been kind of a crusader, you know, for this entire issue. So I want to begin today's conversation with you and request your opening statements. Uh, in specific, if you can help us understand two things, sir. One, that you know, you've approached the Supreme Court twice now, and the Supreme Court said it cannot direct uh, the parliament to, or nudge the parliament to come up with a comprehensive anti-torture law. So why do you think uh, does India still not have a comprehensive law on torture? And what would you think are the broad contours uh, of a comprehensive anti-torture law? Sir, over to you. And if I may request all the panelists to limit their responses to five minutes so that we can have a quick uh, round of questions and then also open to questions from our audience who are watching. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Avni, for this very comprehensive introduction as an opening to the discussion this afternoon. Uh, since you have raised several questions, I will try to compress my answers in the five minutes allotted. Let me begin by saying that as a dignitarian, my head hangs in shame that my country stands in line, not with the rest of the civilized 170 countries who have signed the UN Convention Against Torture, but with the failed and the semi-failed and the dictatorial regimes like Sudan, Brunei, et cetera, et cetera. The reason why we have not been able to sign the UNCAT that is the UN Convention Against Torture, is simply because we do not as yet have a domestic legislation, which as per India's state practice is necessary before we undertake any international treaty obligations. India signed the UNCAT in 1997 
but we are now in 2020, but we have not been able to ratify the convention, which means that during this time from at least 1997 to 2020, which is 23 long years, we have not been able to persuade government or parliament to enact a law, which is a prerequisite for us to become responsible members of the international legal regime against torture. In 2010, finally, when the UPA government was in office, a select committee of Rajya Sabha was constituted to propose a draft comprehensive standalone law against custodial torture. I had the privilege and the pleasure of serving as the chairman of that committee. And within three months, in a non-partisan committee, rising above partisan considerations, the Select Committee of Parliament in its wisdom proposed a draft law. We studied various uh, legislations in various countries and uh, we came up with a draft law that was comprehensive enough and aligned to all the features in the UNCAT. The matter could not be taken up by parliament because around that time the, the parliament had become dysfunctional. In 2014, there was a change of government. I myself wrote to Honorable the Prime Minister, Honorable the Home Minister, Shri Rajna Singhji at that time, and later took up this matter through letters and personally with a number of important people, requesting them that this is a non-partisan issue, flows directly from our commitment to Article 21, that is right to life and dignity, with dignity as the core constitutional value, and therefore this should be passed as a humanitarian law. I failed in my entreaties and then in my own name moved a public interest litigation requesting the Honorable Supreme Court to exercise its nudge or suggestive jurisdiction to advise the government that such a law it will necessarily be in aid of Article 21 and will be able over time to prevent if not totally eliminate custodial torture. The matter was heard by a bench of four chief justices. The final bench was won by Justice Ranjan, had been by Justice Ranjan Gagoy. I argued this matter for four hours, nonstop. And almost anything that could have been said was said. At the end of uh, a three month wait after the close of the hearing, or even more, I think it was a longer wait, we finally got a four, around 40 page judgments, a very elaborate judgments giving all the reasons which I have not been able to, to find intelligible enough to say why even a nudge jurisdiction was not possible in the circumstances of the case. Now, I ask myself if in the case of honor killings, if in the case of uh, uh, mob lynching, Supreme Court could in its wisdom suggest such a law to parliament, why it could not do so in this case. Now we know on high authority that when human dignity is a core constitutional value, torture cannot coexist with that, uh, with that value. And this has been said over and over again by the Supreme Court itself. The most elaborate uh, of his judgments in D.K. Basu talked about torture being the darker side of human civilization. Quoting Adriana Balto, the court said that torture is a pain so intangible that there is no way to heal it. It scars not only the man's psyche or the heart, it scars the conscience of the nation. It certainly scars the dignitarian conscience of our democracy and the dignitarian conscience of our constitution. I am baffled, I am absolutely stunned to find how a court which in Nagaraj and in Shara Bano says that the power of judicial review is to be exercised in aid of constitutional democracy, in aid of constitutional values, and has exercised, rightly so, that power on several occasions, chose not to exercise that power uh, in this case. I must say that uh, in fairness to the organizers of uh, this debate, that they have chosen an absolutely appropriate subject for discussion. The happenings in Tamil Nadu have once again shocked the conscience of the nation 
And I hope that this will spur the entire nation to rise as one, to make sure that we have a domestic law. The signing of the UNCAT is a consequence. That will be a consequential act. And that will be in aid of our international treaty obligations under Article 51C and 253 of the Constitution. But the more important thing is, how can we not have a law against torture consistent with our well-entrenched jurisprudence on human dignity and consistent with the expansive interpretation of Article 21? That's the question I ask myself over and over again. And I must take just one more minute before I close. The argument that separation of powers does not permit the court to even exercise its nudge and suggestive jurisdiction is an utterly flawed argument for the reason that the court itself has not abided by this argument. And it has said in several cases, and in fact, in this very judgment, in my case, it said that all organs of the state have to work in unison for the advancement of constitutional gain, uh, goals, which means the executive, the parliament, and the judiciary. Judiciary being the ultimate arbiter of constitutional conscience, judiciary being the ultimate custodian of the values of the Republic, is expected certainly to intervene in a case where torture of citizens, torture of individuals, mock our claims to the dignitarian democracy. This is far too important a subject where the court can take a hands-off approach. My disappointment is with the government. Certainly, my disappointment also is with parliament, but less so because the select committee of parliament, which is a mini parliament, has in fact proposed the law, but the government failed to bring place the law for enactment for A reason or for B reason. All governments failed. But my greatest disappointment, I must say, with the utmost deference to the Supreme Court uh, and to Justice Gupta, has been uh, with the court, because this was one case which I thought was an unanswerable case. And despite the fact that it was heard at great length and four chief justices of India chose it fit to hear after notice, represented by no less a person than the Attorney General, uh, failed to do so. And finally, the Law Commission of India in 2017, under this government, recommended that there must be a standalone custodial torture law. The Human Rights Commission, in an affidavit filed in my petition before the Honorable Supreme Court, said that we must have such a law. The Select Committee of Parliament said we must have the law. Supreme Court, in its umpteen judgments, had said that torture and human dignity and constitutional values do not exist. Still, we do not have the law. So therefore, I think a time has come for us to uh, wake up and stand tall within ourselves, within the country, and in the Committee of Nations uh, on the question of torture. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashwini Kumar, for setting the stage for us. Sir. And I want to go next to Justice Deepak Gupta. So, you know, uh, based on what Ashwini Kumar was saying, perhaps there is no debate that everybody is more or less in a unison voice as far as the need for a comprehensive law is concerned. I mean, the Supreme Court of India in DK, as back as in 1997, in the famous DK Basu versus State of West, West Bengal, laid down a series of guidelines, uh, you know, to suggest what can be done to make sure that police stays within its powers. Uh, everybody is more or less aware of those guidelines. And then as recent as in two, 2017, uh, in the case of injury human conditions versus State of Assam, the Supreme Court once again lamented that in spite of these rules and guidelines, uh, there seems to be a major challenge of implementation. So I want to come to you, sir, and, and you know, have two specific questions for you. One, do you think that based on what guidelines and rules we already have, there is still a case in your opinion for a comprehensive law? And assuming that that answer is in the positive, in addition to having a comprehensive law, what are the other challenges that India has in terms of effectively implementing an uh, anti-torture law? Because uh, there are many laws in India, but we, we have seen in India in our experience that merely having laws is not sufficient. And if while we're at it, sir, there's another you know quick question I'm tempted to uh, ask, because that's a question there are a lot of people outside the legal circles also ask, which is, 
that there seems to be a difference of approach that the Supreme Court adopts in different cases. So while there have been cases where the Supreme Court has taken a more activist stand and has nudged the parliament to pass certain laws, why that reluctance in other cases? So what explains this kind of difference of approaches, nudging in some cases, but refusing to interfere in other cases? Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Abhini. Uh, I think I'll take your last question first, because that uh, is, will flow from what Dr. Ashwini Kumar said. I don't, I respectfully don't agree with him. on Because I feel that judgment, uh, the judgment of Justice Sanjeev Khanna is not only intelligible, but it's totally in accordance with the theory of separation of parts of the constitution. And there are four paragraphs, 27, 28, 31, 32, which very well, lay, and it lays out why the court felt that what it had done in Visakha or other cases, it was not willing to do here. See, there, there were many aspects because first of all, this was not, the judgment was given in 2017. It was not given in 2019. The judgment was given in 2017 where the case was sent that it will matter with parliament, so parliament will take on. Then Dr. Ashwini Kumar filed an MA. This is not a writ petition. It was a miscellaneous application that since parliament has not taken any action, now you direct it to. See, I, I don't, I mean, can't take out the exact, but I think somewhere in that judgment it is recorded that he was, that Dr. Ashwini Kumar was insisting that the court should direct parliament to uh, frame a law in this regard. It was not a nudge jurisprudence which he was praying for. He was asking for a direction which obviously no court can give a direction to the court. And this matter is already with parliament. The reply of the state was that, well, we've sent it to eight, all the states, eight states and union territories have replied, we are waiting for the, I'm not in agreement with you. As far as the other aspect, as you rightly said, there can be no manner of doubt that we require an anti-torture law. I am with Dr. Ashwin Kumar on that, that we require. But whether that, but in my opinion, that law has to be passed by parliament. The court can't take over the role of the parliament. You see, it's a very dangerous trend. You take over today, courts decide what is legal and what is illegal. I've been termed as an activist judge, and I'm quite proud to be an activist judge. But we have to be activist judges within the four corners of the jurisprudence. Once you go beyond that jurisprudence, then I think you're stretching your powers too wide. Having said that, in any civilized society, torture is an anathema to any civilized society. And any society or country which turns a blind eye or which even ignores any torture, custodial torture or any torture of any kind, whether it leads to death or otherwise, cannot call itself a civilized society or country. And I am strongly of the view that if we have to be a civilized society and country, we need to take action in these matters. Now, you know, the question next is, as you put it, that even if you frame a law, so what? Who's going to implement it? How do you implement it? Even today, as you yourself pointed out, there are various sections. In this Tamil Nadu case, they can be tried for murder. But where will the evidence come from? So that is where D.K. Basu and in fact before that Juginder Singh become very important. That the court thought that without entrenching upon the realm of the uh, legislature, they could give certain guidelines to ensure that the law is followed. You know, unfortunately, that has not been done. You know, you'll be surprised to know that I was just going through when I was, you asked me to, I was preparing for this. In Tamil Nadu, there is a specific section, uh, rules framed in this regard. That there is a criminal rules of practice of 2019 made by the High Court of Madras, which says no accused shall be placed under remand for the first time unless he is produced physically at the time of remand before the judge of the magistrate shall see if there is any injury on the person. And that's a rule framed by the High Court. You have that rule, but that rule has been violated and violated with impunity in this case. Because as what the report says, the magistrate was on the second floor or something and the police got him, uh, showed him the accused from the gate of the building. Finally, any law which you have or you don't have will only be if you can implement the law properly. You see, 
precaution judgment where the supreme court said that the police forces should be divided into law and order and other if that is followed it can make a difference we and it's for 30 years the court has been crying hoarse that do something on this separating powers among even in the police they not done it the last thing i would like to say is police brutality we are seeing very even during the covid times we seeing police brutality and we seeing police being helpful also but the cases of brutality are more and they have been very rough with the, you see because at the end of the day it's the poor and the underprivileged who face the wrath of the police we are who are in privileged positions they don't attack us and what was the offense in this tamil nadu case that they kept the shop open for 15 minutes after the curfew time was it even such a serious offense that they should have been taken into custody i mean at best a case could have been lodged against them. we when we become almost like a police state when the police starts running the country it becomes you know it's almost like that situation that they feel that they are above the law and then the trouble starts since i have had only 5 minutes i'll stick to my 5 minutes and then maybe if i have more time i'll just this is my opening suggestion i feel we have to be more practical i would love a law let me be very clear that i would love an anti torture law but before we have an anti torture law even now we have only 5% conviction of in cases of police brutality let's first implement the law as we have it even that we can't implement because the investigation is not fair because the prosecution is not fair because even sometimes the judges get in front that these are the police people we want so I'll... Uh, and thank you thank you justice deepak gupta uh, coming to you uh, sunetra there are two questions i have specifically for you if you could incorporate them and respond to them in your opening statements well a you know we have seen that the police brutality takes different forms right so uh, some of the allegations were uh, how the police behave with the anti ca protesters in delhi for example including lati charge in some cases then there is a question of fake encounters you know that's also a specific concern that's been constantly on the rise if we were to go by statistics there is a question of custodial death as we're discussing today but then also custodial rape i mean just as recent as yesterday we now have a report from orissa where a minor girl of 13 year old a dalit girl was allegedly raped by an inspector uh, of police now the question is in your reporting experience do you think that with the media kind of a covers all these stories adequately or there are some factors as to why some stories get the kind of attention they do i mean it was very interesting to see that you know in case of uh, the recent tamil nadu story it became a national outrage where there are so many different incidents uh, on an everyday basis you know which nobody highlights nobody talks about so what's a broadly my question is what's the role of media in reporting and in your reporting experiences have you come across stories that also suggest that the increasing number of statistics may have to do something with uh, you know the state impunity involved i mean i gave you the statistics at the beginning right but these numbers are constantly on a massive rise what explains that in your experience well, you know avni as as a reporter who's and a journalist who's been now working for two decades and the reason why it's all very fresh in my mind is because the two last books that i wrote they had a lot to do because they were about prison they had a lot to do and they dealt a lot with this entire issue of torture so first of all so i first of all i disagree with this whole thing of saying that are we seeing rising instances of it i just think that it has always been there uh what i think a large part of it of me i really truly believe is that it happens a lot in in, in police stations in custody as you said but because for a lot of time for a long time people just think that the people who are in custody are people who deserve to be there a lot of people just don't care now because as part of my research i did a lot of work and if we see even in the 70s justice krishna ayer and others were writing really uh you know really really kind of uh, kind of updated judgments about human rights and they were addressing this issue of torture and of custodial torture 
So it's something that has always been an issue and has been addressed by various people like Justice Krishna Iyer and his judgments are really evolved. And if you look at it, if you go by prison rules, if you go by police conduct, if you go by the CRPC, there are systems in place which are meant to take care of it. So what has gone wrong? So what has gone wrong? My theory, this is of course my theory, and I'll give you a couple of instances of that, is I really believe that a majority of the people really don't care what happens and the kind of torture that happens because they feel it's happening to people who are criminals, who deserve to be beaten up, and so who cares about their human rights? This has been the kind of mindset which has stopped people from and stopped tortures from taking place and stopped the fact that we and and led to a stage where we are still witnessing widespread torture without anyone raising an eyebrow i'll give you an instance of that the instance of that most recently was when we were hearing the mercy petitions of the nirbhaya case convicts the murderers and rapists of nirbhaya during those hearings we got to know and Part of it, why I watched them very closely was that they used Black Warrant, my book, in order to highlight the fact that the Nirbhaya rapists and murderers were one of them, Ram Singh, he was tortured and he was one of the, the jailer makes his revelation that he was tortured, that all of them were tortured, but he was murdered in custody after that torture. Now, when this was brought to light in front of the Supreme Court bench, they said, how does it matter now? Now, if you look at that kind of attitude and if you compare it to what's happened in the US, for instance, the Epstein case, in the Epstein case, even Epstein was in jail for a horrific crime of sexual harassment, of sex, sexual crimes. But when he, in jail, when he committed suicide, they didn't say that, okay, fine, this is somebody who has done something reprehensible. And so nobody cares. It's good riddance that he's, you know, he's dead, whether it is by suicide or murder. You had FBI, you had everybody get in there and conduct a proper inquiry. Did we have that when Ram Singh died in jail? We didn't have that. And when those facts were brought to light in front of Supreme Court by the jailer at that time saying that they were all tortured, no one cares. Why? Because of the fact that, you know, the entire mindset is if someone is so horrific that they have done this vile act of crime against uh, the 23-year-old paramedic, then it's okay if he's tortured. So if you come from that mindset, then it also then perpetuates that in a way that that's what lawmakers, that's what the police think. It's okay because in their mind, whoever they're catching, whoever's a criminal, it's okay to act like that. And that kind of spirals off. So I started with the whole Mukesh Singh thing. You were talking about, about rapes in, in custody. If we, if we look at the whole Mathura case, it started with that. And as part of research of my book, we recently, uh, you know, there are so many instances of transgenders being raped in jail. And, and the whole reason, in fact, one of the last, one of the latest PUCL studies that was done in Karnataka says that if you're a transgender, then there is a high, there is not just a high possibility that you will end up in jail because you'll be harassed by the police. And Justice Gupta was talking about the fact that, you know, the latest case that we're seeing in Tamil Nadu, why were they tortured? Because they had kept their shops open for a long time. I just want to point out that there are unverified reports, but there seems to be much more than that. There seems to be a history of, a, of disagreement with the police of the area and those shopkeepers, which later manifested itself into this kind of torture. In the same way, this transgender, just to kind of show you how torture is perpetuated and tolerated by the system, this transgender in Rajasthan was raped inside the jail. Why was she first of all taken to jail? Because of the fact that the policemen harassed them. They thought they could get away with sexual harassment just because they were hijras, just because they were transgenders. And then when they objected, it led to a scuffle and they took the whole bunch of uh, the, the hijra community, that small group of hijras, to jail. And one of them, they then proceeded to torture and rape. And just to give you an instance of just because she was a transgender and didn't come from the mainstream community, the, we know, and, and this happened after 2012, 
Now we know that if someone says that they've been raped, that they it's their word that the police has to go by. But the police wanted her before there was no charge sheet filed in that case, and they wanted her, in fact, to go through a lie detector test. And in fact, nothing happened to those police officials. So I just want to give you an instance. What I my, the point I'm trying to make is that yes, there is outrage about torture, but it also depends on who is tortured. So if we have very clear in our mind, if the media reporting is done in such a way that we get to know that the poor vegetable vendor who we can see is a poor person, and then if he is beaten by the police's lati, then, the, then there is outrage. Okay, fine, you know, this, this person, it's wrong, and then there is outrage, and then somebody, there is kind of, something that's done about it. However, if there is a torture of someone who's an accused of a crime, who's in jail, you do not see the same kind of outrage. You do not see, and which is why a lot of the reports of people being hit, of custodial deaths, I mean, when was, the, do we even know the fact that in Tihar jail, the number of custodial deaths has been increasing? Why hasn't the NHRC taken it out? Why is it that there is nobody who is asked for an explanation of the Tihar uh, director general it's because it's believed that if there are people in there they must have done something and so the police need to beat them up in order to keep them under control there is there are really no there's no dearth of such instances of me so i just want to say that it, it's a problem of mindset which has been perpetuated by the government by policymakers, by everyone and as society as large and until we tackle that problem, there's really no point of bringing in a new torture law. And your, about your other question of how media sees it, I accept that there is a problem in the way the media handles it as well. And this I learned from when I interviewed this person who was accused of the 7-7 bomb, serial bomb attacks in Mumbai, which took place in 2006. And I interviewed this person who, Wahid Sheikh, who had been in jail for 11 years, had gone to such extensive torture that he was slowly losing his eyesight as a result of that torture. And then he'd been acquitted after being tortured and incarcerated for 11 years. And when I asked him, why do you think this happened? You know what he said? He said, because it was so easy, the media could have seen, I was accused of being a terrorist, but they didn't, media didn't ask a simple question, which was, if I was a terrorist, why is it that after I allegedly planted the bombs, I would go back to my house and then I would appear for questioning every day to the police station. And then the police would arrest me two months later. So it was, you know, the media failed in a lot of these cases to ask some of the basic questions because we tend to believe the lawmakers we tend to believe the police law enforces police's version. And it's only later, or if in the Tamil Nadu case, where we have this, why, why is it that the media really took it up? Abhi? It's because of that Instagram and that social media post of that young woman, you know, God bless her, who made this very graphic video detailing the kind of torture that these two people in Tamil Nadu had gone through. And it's because of that going viral on social media, because it was so obvious that we couldn't keep our eyes shut anymore. But in other cases where it's not so obvious, where it's happening over there, where we hear about it in courts, then I think people just find it very easy to ignore. Until that mindset changes, I don't think torture as, as a reality is going to go anywhere. Avni? Thank you, Sunetra. Those are some very powerful points that you packed in uh, in your opening statements. Um, I mean, you know, and especially all, before you go back to the discussion, uh, I'll just take one more minute because there were some very important points that uh, Justice Gupta made. And since it is a petition uh, I have lived with for a long time, and since I think he has not had the benefit of the full petition, uh, he has only read the MA judgment. I should like to make two things absolutely clear. First of all, I would like to thank him that he has in fact accepted the need for a law and then nothing less was expected of a distinguished Supreme Court judge. I never asked for a writ or a direction. I, I was at pains to tell the court, please exercise your jurisdiction, your nudge jurisdiction. This is a part of my detailed written submissions 
in the original matter when it came up in 2017 the attorney general said that the law commission having given up its recommendations government is actively seized of the matter and therefore the matter was disposed of in 2009 when i made the ma i in my written arguments and i can give a copy of those written arguments to justice gupta it was clearly stated that please use the weight of your moral authority to nudge the court assume assume for the sake of argument and justice gupta is too distinguished a judge for me to tell him the elementary thing assume i had asked for a writ there is always a prayer or such other appropriate orders as the court may deem fit they could have not given a writ even assume i had asked for a writ i have not asked for a writ they could have still said while we cannot direct the parliament to pass laws and this is elementary i know that uh, this much law i know that the court can't direct parliament to pass law but i also know hundreds of ju uh, judgments right from the time of krishna ayer in 79 in sunil batra's case when he said that constitution does not part company with the convict at the prison gates and then francis colleri that if you if you are not keeping the dignity of a person you are violating the constitution pro tanto so they could still have exercised the nut jurisdiction just as they did in the case of honor killings and mob lynchings i want to ask myself this question and nobody to ask anybody else i want to ask myself this question if certainty and stability in the law is the justification of us accepting the precedent system where is the element of subjectivity in choosing one case to advise the parliament or government to do something and not choosing the other case assuming i was not uh, 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 good enough to present my case in a manner it could in a matter so important to the constitutional conscience could the could the could the court not in the exercise of its plenary jurisdiction i think we not we i think we uh, dr kumar we going into something which is not the subject matter for no, this is a subject matter yeah. very much just so. matter is whether we need a law not whether the government is right we need a law therefore related to whether we need a law is whether the whether the supreme court could have advised or suggested to parliament to enact a law it is directly related to what we are discussing now Uh, so with respect uh, you know i, I think uh, dr kumar gets a fair point to make uh, but just just to request because we know that dr atwini kumar was a petitioner before the supreme court without going into the specifics of that particular uh, case so, uh, justice deepak gupta i want to come to you with another important question which in fact two of our panelists are also raising uh, mr dhanasekaran thangaswami and mr pradeesh vishwanathan ayer so their question is what about the role of the magistrate now in a series of judgments some of which we discuss in this case dk basu you know i mean there have been clear instructions about what the magistrate is supposed to do and yet every now and then it is seen that even when the police is clearly in the breach of its power questions are raised about what about the accountability of the magistrates if i may add another layer to that question from a legal perspective sir one is the responsibility of magistrates but second is a question of vicarious responsibilities of senior leaders so very often they not it is seen that in cases of custodial deaths or custodial violence it is usually the officers in the lower rung who are either required you know, to uh, uh, retire or compensation or something but very 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 uh, few times do we see the buck be passed actually to the person who is at the top of the chain so to say so what about the concept of vicarious responsibility and making senior police officers liable and what about the accountability of magistrates even if you have a court law the magistrates accountability could not be a part over to you sir you just uh, give me one a minute because i want to respond to what sumitra said and i think she made a very very valid point sumitra's point was very valid that as a mindset as soon as somebody is accused of rape or soon as somebody is said to be a terrorist or soon as somebody is said to be a murderer or any other heinous crime society believes let's hang him what happened in hyderabad about 6 months back when four people were shot dead they may have been guilty of rape i'm not holding any grief for them they may have been guilty but in a country with professors to believe in the rule of law they had to have a fair trial we gave a fair trial to kasa 
So why can't we give a fair trial to everyone? But that, what Sunitra made is a very valid point, is a mind in the mindset. What are we witnessing all over the country? We're witnessing lynch, lynching, mob lynchings. If, they, if you feel that somebody is guilty of something which you feel is a heinous crime, well, string him up. Are we to have kangaroo courts? If we are to be a civilized country, if we are to be a country known over the world as a country which is a holder of the rule of law, of human rights, then we have to say, we have to say no to them. But coming to the next point, before I come to the role of the magistrates, Article 21 of the Constitution says that no person can be deprived of his life or liberty except in accordance with the due process of not the due process, but we are in accordance with law. Now, what does the law provide under section 167 of the CRPC? In normal cases, I'm talking about that the magistrate will decide whether to give him release him on bail or whether to remand him in police custody or in uh, to judicial custody. Later, whether bail is to be granted or not granted is for the courts to decide. Therefore, I think it is the moral responsibility of all courts, not only of the magistrates, of all courts to ensure that the people who are kept in custody because of orders passed by them, they are your responsibility. And I've been saying this wherever I've been Chief Justice, I've been sending it to my magistrates that you cannot take this away. When you don't grant a person bail, rightly so, your order may be right that he is not to be uh, uh, granted bail. But then you can't deprive him of his human rights even in jail. He is entitled to his dignity. Yes. Yes. So a quick intervention there. Your point about the moral responsibility of all courts is well taken. But the question is that you know, if a magistrate is seen to be clearly in violation of these guidelines, where is the legal accountability, sir? I think, you see, legal accountability, I'm not going to, I'm not even prepared that, I told you, when, but I think the High Court can take action against the magistrate, even throw him out of job. You see, you take action in two cases, throw two magistrates out of job, everybody else will follow you. That is where the High Court has to come. The High Court has administrative control over the state judiciary. If it feels that a magistrate has been sending people, you know, when I, I have seen as chief justice or a judge in charge of certain districts. That sometimes I would see for petty offenses, people kept in jail for years on end. And when we go to jail and he said, teen saal ho gai, ko jail mein ki offense kya hai? If I, so I used to tell them, why do you not even, you know, release them on personal bail bonds? Because they don't have the mindset. They just feel ki ye to criminal hai, isko sadne do. See, torture is not only the physical torture of being beaten up, but when you keep a man behind bars for a crime which is very minor, for which if he pleaded guilty, he would have been get off with the lesser. So I am not very sure about the legal accountability because I think magistrate would say it's in accordance with duty. He may play. I'm not studied that for today's discussion, but I definitely feel that if the magistrate acts in such a manner, then the high court should take action. And it's only then that a message will go. Otherwise, no message is going to go. Then, uh, in your next question on the vicarious liability of these senior police officers. See, what happens in most of these cases is, most of these cases is, orders are given orally, is Komaro. How do you prove it in court? Finally, you see, we, uh, like we say, the rule of, apply, law, uh, rule of law must apply to the, those people in prison. It will also be, uh, must apply to those uh, who are accused of such offence. You can't have a different standard for them. The, uh, I wish that if that anti-torture law comes, then it includes such provisions for having vicarious liability of at least the one se immediate senior officer. Even, but even in the law proposed by uh, the select committee of which Dr. Kumar was the head, the word is intention is used. So intention may or may not be there if he is not directly involved. I'm not going to, it will be very case specific. But I definitely fe do feel that uh, there has to be accountability at the higher levels also. The only issue is how do you prove the accountability? Right, right. Noted, sir. Uh, Dr. Ashwini Kumar, sir, I want to come to you. Uh, and, you know, for the benefit of our audience, uh, understand something that I think you're uniquely placed to answer. 
so and this question that i'm asking i think you know uh, everybody appreciates is kind of nicely sitting between law and politics so you have tried to fight for this cause pursue this matter both within the parliament and outside it you have knocked the doors of the parliament and the supreme court so clearly your passion towards bringing a comprehensive law is unquestionable so the question is that if we look from from a legal lens if i may say so into how the workings of the parliament how is it determined what question or issue gets the priority so as a law minister you know when you were part of the upa government uh, you know there were challenges you know you've talked about it in other interviews how you tried very hard to bring this law and you know somehow it just could not come up uh, you know in the kind of priority so to say so so what are some of the can you take us through some of the difficulties in terms of the working of the parliament that you think even some of the very important national issues may sometimes fail to get the attention unless we have an unfortunate incident like the one we do at the moment and is there something that can be done about that because to me that is you know a bigger issue uh, which speaks to a lot of these issues that we talk about every time they are picked up by the media well you raise an extremely complex question about prioritization of the legislative agendas of government well i must tell you that as law minister that was not my remit that is always the remit of the parliamentary affairs minister who discusses the matters uh, the, which have to be placed before the uh, houses of parliament and the priority to be given to each with the cabinet with the prime minister and that is how matters move but in this particular case i think had there not been the kind of dysfunctionality we saw in the regime of the up in the last two years when almost no legislative agenda of any consequence was allowed to go through we would have passed this bill because the then prime minister was keen to redress and address the grievances of the international community that india being a proud democracy Uh, should not be lagging behind uh, in passing this kind of a humanitarian law and that is how this co committee was constituted i must tell you for the benefit of all your viewers that there is a mechanism which is known as the universal periodic review of the record of human rights in various parts of the world and this is undertaken under the auspices of the un in geneva periodically every one or two years and traditionally the attorney general for india represents the government of the day in these hearings we placed before the supreme court the record from 2008 onwards when on each occasion the attorney general promised the international community for passing that law and every year there was a polite censor of india in the records of the un which are all documented and available where it was said that india is still not kept up its obligation or its commitment to ratify the convention for want of a law now to answer your question the prioritization is done according to politics of the day according to the consensus of the day for example when upa government was in power in those two years the main priority was the right to uh, to food act and the constitution amendment bill for the appointment of judges you will be surprised to know that the only question on which there was unanimity across the political spectrum was to do away with the collegium system and all the political parties joined hands to pass the constitution amendment it's another matter that the supreme court in its wisdom struck it down late uh, later now one of the things uh, we also noticed that uh, justice gupta briefly mentioned about the gap in the law and vishal khand all that absence of a law there can't be a greater gap in the law than the absence of a law all constitutional imperatives all constitutional goals are actually implemented through statutory frameworks and all laws are in aid of the constitution so today we i concede straight away having been a parliamentarian having been a minister having been a lawyer that there is a collective failure of sorts and i'm i'm not um, i'm not unduly critical i understand the limitations of each organ of the state but i do know that when the body of the indian republic would decide all organs of the state will converge to achieve a particular end the important thing that you, one of the figures that you mentioned five custodial deaths a day is only the official figure in fact the custodial deaths are far more 
In fact, the Asian Human Rights Review brings out the total number of uh, deaths and tortured cases much more. And there's a bizarre provision, which I did not know, only when I was preparing my petition, I came to know. There's a bizarre provision either in the under the NHRC Act or the Police Bureau, I'm not sure about which one, that you can only record those cases of torture that lead to death. Those cases of torture which don't lead to death are not even recorded. So the problem is endemic. Tamil Nadu case has only brought up front something which is a reality. And one more minute I have to give because some examples were given and that I think examples which Sunitra gave and which Jad Saab gave, you know, they prove the point. Now let me give you my own example. There's a convention that when a minister takes oath and he returns to his constituency, he's received at the, uh, at the, at the border of the constituency by the heads of administration of the police and the DC. When I went back after taking oath, it was, I think, in 2011, for the second time when I took oath of office, I saw a huge crowd that had collected there, one very elderly individual standing alone, distraught with grief, with agony writ large on his face, absolutely unconcerned with the commotion around him. He caught my attention and I asked my one of my colleagues and secretaries to ask him what his problem was. And they said, he wants to talk to you alone. So I said, yes, I will talk to him alone. And, and he came over, he's an elderly gentleman with flowing white beard. And I, I knew at the moment I saw him that something was absolutely wrong with, with him. He said, I, have two, I had two sons. One son has been killed in a police encounter already. My other son is currently in police custody. He is being given the third degree. And I fear that if somebody will not intervene on, on, on his behalf, he will be done to death in, in, in custody. I was shocked and shaken, I distraught myself. I did bring up the SSP of the, the district. He did confirm that so-and-so was with him. And I said, whatever investigations you want to do, please do. But you must know that in our country, in our democracy, third degree is outlawed and no longer permissible. In fairness to that good officer, he rang me up in an hour. He said, I've had the matter examined. You are right, sir. So and so is with us. So far, we feel that he's not guilty. And I have given orders of his release. But we knew that by that time, he had been thoroughly, thoroughly tortured. It's another matter that with God's intervention, he was saved. But the reality on the ground is, as Justice Gupta rightly says, law alone will not eliminate torture. It will go a long way in helping. And the law that we had proposed was is a comprehensive law where the question you raised about sanctioning, about the sanction from the government to prosecute the errant officials. All those have been addressed. Compensation, rehabilitation, witness protection, um, uh, the, the kind of uh, treatment that will be treated as torture, because torture has now so many different uh, ways that it is impossible to give an exhaustive de definition. So we gave an inclusive definition of torture, specifically saying that such acts are positively proscribed and anything that causes physical or mental uh, torture will be proscribed. And, and again, I think Justice Gupta said, or someone said, that look at people being detained. Yeah, I think Justice Gupta said, without, without any cause for years. I just read today a, a youth from Kashmir, if I'm not mistaken, his name is Latif, released after 24 years, no case having been found. Who is going to give him back the 24 years of his life? What kind of a compensation can any law provide for this kind of incarceration? So therefore something is absolutely wrong. Our, our conscience as a nation is scarred on this point. And I think we will only be able to claim ourselves as true citizens of this great country if all of us today join and take a pledge that this kind of maltreatment of citizens and individuals will not be tolerated by the nation. And this is non-partisan issue. It's a humanitarian issue. Nobody uh, uh, says that torture for any reason at any place can be minister of the country and one of his official engagements said there is no scope for torture in a body politic. Just Mr. Venkaya and I do in an article or in a statement said no question of torture and rightly so. And rightly so. And I must say that when I took my 
pr proposal and petitions at the highest level of the government. All of them were sympathetic. What the reasons are, why this law is not being passed, why this is not given the priority, I can't tell you. But as of now, we are failing in our duty to pass an anti-torture law, which is an absolute necessity today. Thank you, sir. That's a very passionate appeal in favor of, uh, uh, you know, anti-torture law. And as you rightly said, it's one of those things where everybody seems to agree, yet nothing uh, seems to move. We just have the last few minutes. And Sunetra, I want to come to you with a question uh, by one of our audience members. You know, you may be aware that as recent as yesterday, uh, a division bench in the Madras High Court directed that uh, the police well-being program should continue. And it seemed to suggest that the mental well-being of police officers is a factor uh, that should be taken into account as a response to police brutality. Now, I want to ask you, without sort of going into the legalities of it, you know, let's leave the law to the lawyers, but from a common man's perspective or woman's perspective who's watching this entire debate, uh, A, do you think that police... Uh, making it a mental well-being issue is the right way to approach it. And number two, you know, speaking of compensation, that's something Dr. Ashwini Kumar touched upon. Now, legally speaking, in the Saheli Kumar case, I mean, we saw a compensation of 75,000 being given to uh, the victim's family. This was in the year 1990. And recently, in the Tamil Nadu case, the government has announced a package of rupees 25 lakhs. So without going into the nitty-gritties of how do we actually come to that figure, maybe I can, you know, uh, have a quick comment from you, Justice Deepak Gupta. Is there a way to quantify the compensation? But without, again, going into the legal, legal side, of it, flagging that for now, is compensation and mental being, uh, uh, mental well-being programs for police adequate response? Is there anything else that can be done in addition? Sunetra, over to you. Uh, Sunetra, you're on mute. You will have to unmute yourself. Sorry, sorry. Um, so I think it's a really important factor in all of this. And like everything else that I've said, it's all based on, you know, the years of reporting and things like that. Um, this, I want to just, uh, you know, because I base everything on what we've seen on the ground. I just want to, when I was in the Indian Express, we, we did this, you know, I did a series which basically had the, you know, life of a police station. And what I learned there, and I was a very young reporter, and what I learned there actually was eye-opening and has filled me with empathy for the police force for life. What the, the government and the, the policymakers expect them to work under tremendously difficult circumstances. So I cannot say this enough. And if we go by the theory of how the oppressed become oppressors, so if you torture someone, they're likely to you know, be in the such situation they just act it out against other people, then you know, I'm not the expert, but it may be something to look at. If you look at the living conditions, if you look at the fact that they have never have very, very rarely do they have proper rest and days off. If you look at the fact that they're compensated very poorly, if you look at the fact that, for example, I'll give you a very small instance. Now, it is a known fact, which is shocking to me, that when a police has to produce a person who is his case, suppose the IO has to produce someone in court, then he has to, how he gets that person in court is his own responsibility. So whether he takes a bus, whether he takes an auto, if he's well off and he has a bike and he takes them there, it's their thing. You know, just this part. So how does, how do most people do it? That's why they bully and harass some other auto person to say, you take us to court because they are not compensated for it. The systems are just not in place in order to provide fair circumstances to police officers. Having said that, it doesn't, of course, condone the fact that they are, that the police get away with murder. I say that because, as we know, there are so many instances and the, and the conviction rate in cases of police excesses of them being punished is perhaps negligible. No one gets punished um, for doing that. However, it is a factor, and I am very, very aware of the fact that they work in pitting circumstances, horrific circumstances. They don't have proper places to be at. They're putting themselves at danger. They're tired. They're harassed, and so they harass other people. However, we do know of police officers who've been through those circumstances. And, and a lot of those perpetrators are, of course, people who are very junior, and they go through these circumstances, and this is their only way. So if, if you 
cut corners and say, you have to produce the results, you have to crack this case, and you haven't given them the resources to do that, they will, of course, they will think that the way to do it is the beat, beat the person into a confession, and which is why we constantly see it. But there are also other issues as well. I mean, one of the things that we really, really know is that there are there is a fantastic system which says that anyone who's accused has to be or is arrested has to be produced in 24 hours in front of the courtroom, and they are now people who are tortured. They say how the judiciary and the people, the magistrates who are supposed to look out for them, don't. They ignore the kind of bruises on their body. So you know, that kind of oversight. We need an oversight to see whether the magistrates were supposed to do that instead of getting into a kind of understanding with the police that they're able to do their job and they do do their job. There are supposed to be judges who are supposed to go and visit prisons and police stations every month. They don't do that. If they do that, they're probably going there to have a cup of tea and not doing the exact job they do. Now, because, you know, because I have uh, Dr. Ashwini Kumar here, I just want to point out one of the things, and I'm not saying that, but I've seen people who have been, who have been harassed and tortured. A lot of them are people who have been charged under UAPA. And that is a law that was brought in by the UPA government, right? It was the answer to the FOTA, which was equally draconian, but the UAPA, which kind of replaced it. And that is the time that we saw a lot of people being charged for Maoist activities without and this law is the one which allows people to even now to be taken in with very flimsy kind of evidence and to be, you know, and that they don't have to be given bail for a long time. So these are laws which kind of facilitate this whole system of torture, of making people, of, you know, making, making them confess by beating them. So these are issues which people have to be accountable for. These, this law which stands there, which was brought in during the UPA, is still something which perpetuates this. I know this because I'll give you an instance. One of the people who I covered in the thing was Kobard Gandhi. Now, Kobard Gandhi, who has, he was arrested in 2009. He's a 70-year-old man. Of, he's a 70-year-old man. And the evidence that they had, and the court threw it out, Delhi courts threw it out, by saying that there is no, just because someone may be may be a sympathizer, it doesn't mean they're part of a terror, terror group. And the court said it. But because the law is such, and because someone can be arrested and kept in jail and tortured for a long time, every time he gets an acquittal from one court, he is then, they make up a similar kind of charge for this in another part of the country and arrest him. Now tell me, this is how we see abuse of law and this is how we see systems being manipulated in order to torture people and to keep someone who is 70 years old and who is a diabetic who has various ailments to keep them in jail and to harass them like that that kind of stuff. who speaks up for them and again no one spoke up for him because of the fact that you know you don't want to be seen as another you know so you suppress dissent against that or disagreement with that because you fear you 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 know you you kind of scare people into thinking that if they speak up they'll be seen as a maoist sympathizer as well and that kind of torture continues so there are so very many issues over here and as you were saying that you know the media the media does ask questions but unfortunately it's so rampant and there are so many cases of this taking you know place across the country that there really is so now and then now and then we have one or two cases which come up and the Tamil Nadu case is an instance of that. And perhaps it's a great way to throw a light on that. But really we have such systemic kind of ways of torturing people that till we don't fix it. And, and, and the point I'm trying to make in all of this is that in our rules, we don't need something new. In our rules, we have fantastic systems in place in order to check that. The fact that this magistrate is supposed to ask that person are you being are you being made to say this are you under pressure but you know you have the police over there who will say if you say something then we'll make sure we break your bones when we go back or there is a system which says in jail that people can just ring the emergency bell and during that emergency they they are free to bring things under control by beating up people so there are so many instances of this and i just think that we need to hear 
from the stakeholders, the people who work in human rights to really find a fix for this because it's not going to go away with another law. It's thanks, not thanks. the human rights activists who are going to find a fix, it's going to be the politicians who are going to find a fix. I'm now more and more convinced, uh, as somebody said, that the destiny of man in our times is determined in political terms. I'm now more and more convinced with my own experience that the political mobilization in the country alone will bring in a law which will be purposive and effective. And let me tell you that if there's any justification of power wielded by anyone, be he a politician, be he a judge, or be he a media person, it is that everyone must work in aid of constitutional goals because it is the constitution that defines the path forward. It is a constitution that expresses the will of the Indian people and no Indian uh, in citizen will countenance compromise with his dignity. Just as there can be no recompense for dignity and a conscience card, there can be no justification whatsoever for any abdication of anyone's role as well as the fight against uh, torture. And I, I think this is just a starting point. There are issues galore. For example, you asked about a question of how to determine compensation. I ask you, what possible compensation can you give to a man who has spent a lifetime in custody without a fault? What compensation can you give to a person who has had his dignity completely taken away from him Loss of self admits of no recompense. There cannot be any recompense. And that is why the Court itself has said that life without dignity is no life. It is, a, it is, it, 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 it is music without sound. So therefore, these, these, you know, compensation and all, these are small consolations. Procedure, yeah, safeguard. There was nothing wrong with Macaulay's law. But let me tell you, I was a law minister when we brought in the criminal law amendment bill. We made very stringent provisions, reverse the presumption of innocence principle. Wrong, it was wrong. I accept publicly it was wrong, but such was the outrage. Such was the outrage that something has to be done. So we can't have a lamppost justice. We can't keep hanging people from lampposts without somebody, uh, somebody's guilt being proved or somebody having an opportunity to prove his innocence. But sometimes lawmaking becomes a function of a popular response. Tamil Nadu case must spur that response so that we have a reasonable but a purposive law against torture. Thank you, Dr. Ashwini Kumar, uh, for that plea. And Justice Deepak Gupta, last question to you and perhaps last word on the webinar today. So, you know, uh, just while we've been on and on about the issue of police brutality, I think it would be unjust you know to end this webinar without also pointing out the numerous cases that i'm sure you know which have come to the supreme court which are about you know political transfers of senior police officers who have sometimes tried very hard to stand up to corruption or how they have been made scapegoats of you know political action or inaction uh, so to say so do you think that while we demand an a, a comprehensive anti torture law in the same vein, we also need to talk about comprehensive reforms to the outdated Indian Police Act and make sure that, you know, a large, large number of police officers in India who still show spine, who still stand up to the right, their rights are also taken care of. Uh, so last word to you, uh, Justice Deepak Gupta. Sir, you're on mute, sir. I, I am tot in total agreement with what you said. You see, we sometimes, as Sunitra rightly said, sometimes they're the harassed and then they start harassing the other. We, when you, you see, when we look, we need comprehensive police reforms. The precaution judgment I already referred to, so I'm not referred to it again. But the training, the only training the cops have today is that slap a man and try to get them to, uh, try to make him confess. They have no forensic skills. You see, because what is happening with the, every judge, with every minister, with every uh, bureaucrat, with each one of us, there are about 10 cops attached and half of the police forces doing VIP duties. We have to divide law and order and those, those who do VIP duties are, have become useless as far as maintenance of... You have to have a crime detection branch. You have, 
nothing is happening. Trainings have to be improved. And you know what you talk about mental health of the Indian, what the, the Madras psycho judgment is not in the nature of that their mental health alone. Because if they are not mentally well looked after, they are going to be abusive towards the uh, people in their custody. We need comprehensive changes, not only in the Police Act, but in the entire manner in which things are done. The law with regard to having uh, police chiefs of a particular tenure and three names being given, every party, you know, it's across the board, every political party, when it is in power, says something else, and when it is in opposition, opposition says something totally else. They, we have no, you know, they have just one view that how, when you are in power, how do you take control of the police? And then that makes the police even more powerful and makes it more oppressive. Because if thanas are to be bought, if transfer to thanas are to be purchased, then obviously you can't expect justice from those, somebody who's paid a crore of rupees to get a particular police station become an SHO of a particular police station, sometimes bidding is done. Now, if this is the system on which transfers are made, not on merit, but on these considerations, and these considerations, then obviously uh, we will not have, so you need police reforms. And those police reforms, in my view, are more necessary than a new law. If those police reforms come out, police is trained in a better manner, then even with the existing laws, we can do better. Because even our existing laws, we are not using them at all. It's very sad. As I said, I totally support. But even till that law comes, even with the existing laws, we can't. But then we only do it if we sort of think of it in a way that we have to get rid of this mentality. If somebody is in jail or somebody is charged of a heinous offense, then he does not have the he does not need to have the benefit of the rule of law. That mindset has to go. We can't see Sunitra is there, but there are uh, uh, there are journalists and journalists. There are some journalists who will hang anybody from the next lamppost. And they change their opinion makers. Because what journalists say matter. And when the journalist says that, yes, he's guilty, now hang him. Well, that's what the public feels. Hang him, so hang him. This is what that for me that was very disturbing what happened in the in Hyderabad because it was as if everybody politicians police officials media everybody had gathered together that they are guilty and if they were shot dead so what I'm sorry if we have this attitude of so what then we cannot be living in a civilized world all of us ought to take that responsibility and see. That what little we can do. We can't change. Uh, Dr. Ashwini Kumar has been trying to change the world. I hope he succeeds. But even if he can't change the world, what little each one of us can do to bring these matters to light, it goes a long way in making a bigger change. Thank you. Thank I, have you. No I have no illusions about my capacity to change the world, yes, sir. I made a very... So that was on the lighter side, sir. I know. And, 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 and Jassa, you are absolutely right. The kind of uh, uh, media trial that impacts the administration of justice is another challenge. But you remember that in Marajkar's case, the, your court said that trial by media offends against the rule of law because it offends against fair trial. But every day, under the nose of the Supreme Court, media trial is happening. Nobody's, nobody's intervening to ensure that there's no media trial. Who but the Supreme Court is in a better position to ensure that its own law is observed. And I think uh, one day we will have to come to that because the right of uh, the media to express itself is also subject to the requirement of a fair trial. And fair trial does get impacted when you create a cacophony around a particular issue, as in the case of Hyderabad. I had myself said in that case, I'd, I'd given an interview saying that constitutionality has been replaced by muscularity. And that cannot be India's way. It cannot be a democratic way. Thank you.
thank you very much to everybody who's watching uh, and if you're listening to dr ashwini kumar wondering about media trial as a topic do watch live laws last webinar and also do tune in on uh, for their next webinar coming monday on constitutional values i think there is a sort of an international reckoning which has affected india that we are uh, we are in a part of uh, in a journey of evolution of democracy where those who wield a danda cannot be out of the scanner forever so we need to make sure that we actively participate in this conversation where the police forces are in focus and talk about their rights and duties and the legal and political solutions for it uh, i thank very much our esteemed panelists for giving us the time uh, for such frank and honest comments and for you know indulging in all the questions and answering them so patiently a big thank you to live law for facilitating this and for bringing all of us together uh, there were about 100 plus questions in the q and a box so my apologies to everybody who's watching and the panelists if you were not able to address all of them uh, but i end on the note that perhaps this is a new beginning a beginning uh, to have a comprehensive law as dr ashwini kumar and all of us would want india to have thank you very much good evening stay safe and stay tuned for the next webinar coming monday thank, thank you. you thank you